When I was um, 10 or 11 years old, I remember going to St. Augustine, Florida for vacation. We stayed in a campground that was on one of the barrier islands off, uh, off the coast there, just a little bit. And our campsite was real close to the ocean, and there was nothing but sand dunes between our campsite and the ocean. And after we got our campsite set up, my brother and I walked to the top of the sand dunes, and for the very first time that I can remember, I saw the Atlantic Ocean. And I can remember precisely what I thought as I stood there and I looked at the Atlantic Ocean for the very first time that I remember. This has been here all this time, and nobody told me. I, I was overwhelmed by what I saw. I, I, being from Indiana, flat wheat fields and cornfields, I, I had no point of perspective or no place or anything in my history by, by which to associate what I was looking at, and I was absolutely overwhelmed. And I kept thinking, this has been here and nobody told me. I've only had that uh, experience one other time in my life, and it's not that I haven't been to incredible places. I, I have climbed the inside of the pyramids in Egypt all the way to the top that you can. I've walked on the Great Wall of China. I mean, these are incredible things, but they did not give me that feeling. The only other time I've ever had that feeling in my life was once again, when my father was taking our family to California and I was 14 or 15 years of age and we had gone through Arizona and stopped at the Grand Canyon and I was not excited about us making this stop. I just wanted to get to California. But I remember getting out of the car and going to this uh, sort of uh, lookout place, walking up to the edge and looking out over the Grand Canyon and once again, I had that feeling of, I can't believe this was here, and nobody told me. It was overwhelming to me. I mean, I, I can't describe to you how I felt or, or what I even saw, because there, I have no vocabulary, I have no words to describe what I was looking at. And, and people try, a painted desert, all, all of these different kind of things, but there are no words that can, that can capture what you see when you stand there at that lookout point at the Grand Canyon. It's just unbelievable. Last week I said that we were going to talk and teach on the sovereignty of God. Now, unless you're some kind of expert reformed theologian, that probably scares you to death as a pastor, but I don't know any better, so I'm, I'm going to wade in on this. When I think about the sovereignty of God, this is where I start. First of all, to think that there are things in the universe that I can't explain. I don't have words to interpret them or to describe them. When I think about, you know, the universe being a hundred million light years out, I, I mean, I, I can't comprehend that. There are other things that, that are beyond my ability to describe. You see, it makes me know that there are things and concepts that God has created that for whatever reason he chose not to let me understand. See, I don't understand completely the notion of time forever in either direction. See, I don't understand that. And he's chosen not to let me comprehend that. The only way that I can come close to understanding it, it is the beginning and then the death of, of my human life. And so that span in there is my concept of time. But to think that God would limit himself to whether or not I could understand it, whether or not I could comprehend it, is probably being naive. This past week, uh, as is often the case, I don't sleep all night, and so I was up in the middle of the night, and I decided to watch on Netflix this uh, documentary on the King James Bible. It was about two hours long, and I started watching it. It was interesting to me, and, and I, I believe that there probably has been nothing written that has changed the course of history quite like the King James Version of the Bible, and that may surprise you if you know me, because... 
uh, I usually teach from a paraphrase of all things. But when you think about the roots of, of this version of Scripture, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. The King James Version of the Bible came about as a result of King James, who I'm not really a fan of, successor to Charles II, predecessor of Queen Elizabeth I, probably the best example of not having incestuous lineage, um, not in any way a figure that you would want to model yourself after. And it makes me know, once again, how God loves to use the most unexpected people to do the most incredible things. Yes, King James makes me know that. But he established these, I won't call them committees, but he established these four units of each of a different sort of philosophical bent, with the exception of the Catholics, from the Puritans all the way to the Anglicans to translate and interpret, and then from each one of those to have a summit that King James himself would oversee. In this process, though, all of these different groups concluded that there were concepts and notions and ideas or even things that they couldn't even understand to articulate that were in there, but there was no human word or picture or sound, if you will, to describe that concept in its entirety. They all agreed that, and that was a struggle. For instance, the word that I think of most often that we, we probably know best is the word agape, which we translate as love. But in Scripture, it is translated different ways. For instance, for God so loved the world, there is this, our word love, which articulates this emotional, compassionate um, feeling that God has towards his creation that he calls humanity. There is another occasion where in 1 Corinthians, it is described or articulated as charity because in the word agape, it means that there is action. See, there, there is no following Christ and loving Christ. If you love me, then keep these things without there being some kind of action. But there is this one word for all of that, which is agape. So at different points, they translate it different ways. There's one that is a, a little more complex and that is the word father or, or perfectly translated Abba. And, and we really struggle with this word. Our father, which art in heaven. And on another occasion, he says our spirit cries out to Abba, father. But it is a much more intimate, much more affectionate notion about God. And in the 15th century, they weren't comfortable with that idea, so they left it there as Abba. But it really means dad or daddy, most accurately interpreted. But they weren't comfortable with that notion. And so there are things that they were honest about in saying we're not quite sure what this means, so we offer this, and, and, and in so doing, making it more authentic, really. So there are many things, even in Scripture, that I don't understand. And Scripture, again, is, for, for me, is bound to my human understanding of language and the pictures of language, the sounds of language, which means that there's a lot of things I don't understand. I don't know. I'm not ever going to know. But there are other things that are clear to me, and I like to think that God intended for this to be simple and pretty easy for me to, to sort of get. And so I keep it there. In Romans chapter 8 is um, one of the passages that I, I think describes something that is often misunderstood, and this is what it says in 28, and we know that all things worked for God for good for those that love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, most preachers stop right there. Even when we quote it, we stop right there. And it is the subsequent verse that probably uh, throughout at least contemporary history has caused at least the most um, consternation and difficulty for, for most pastors. And this is what it says. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren and sisters. Those whom he predestined, 
okay? He also called, those who called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. Now, what does that mean? Well, that has. It's, it's been a passage of Scripture, particularly for, for uh, people in sort of our school of thinking, that has been difficult for us to explain. And so often, if something is difficult, we, don't, we just don't touch it. We just leave it alone and, and sort of give a spin here and there on it. But uh, we're not big about, uh, you know, harping on that. And this is what I think that really means. I think this. It means, before I was, all right, God knew me. His provision and plan was to save me, the whosoever clause. I was chosen before I was created to be the object of his mercy. See, I believe that before I was ever here, God knew me, had a plan for me. And the object of that was to express his mercy. And so previously destined for God's mercy and be glorified so that I bring glory to God. To me, it is obvious that man can choose contrary to what God intended and how God wanted that to play out. So when I look at the first part of the passage that I just wrote to you, I believe that God is working with us as people to constantly take those choices which we make that mess up our lives, okay, to bring them back into a place that ultimately makes our lives better and brings glory to Him. And the second part, I believe that God knew me before I was here. And I believe that I was created to be the object of of God's mercy. But just like Adam and Eve, I think that I can choose not to do that. And when I do that, it messes up my life terribly. And so if I ask him, he steps in and he helps me and works with me to restore me to a place that brings glory ultimately to him. When I think about this, um, the business of choice and ultimate destiny, Think for a moment about the fact that uh, here in Virginia, we have a scholarship program called the Virginia 259 program, which means that you can contribute up to $15,000 a year into a child's education scholarship fund. And I have friends that did this very thing. They were wanting to adopt a child. And before that child was, they established a Virginia 259 fund. Now, I can tell you that these people anticipated that their child would go to college. They anticipated that their child would become an engineer and use that money in, their, in his or her education to become an engineer before they ever got the child. You see, in their mind, they had decided that, and then they got a child. And all the way through, they were doing everything they could to direct the child in that direction. And every year, they would contribute to that fund, that that tax fund for education at some later date that was never taxed because you were using it as an education fund. But when the kid graduated from high school, the last thing on his mind was ever going to college. Now, they did everything they could to persuade him, to encourage him to go on to college, but but he didn't. Because by choice, he chose not to. He chose not to. Think of it this way, and I, I believe that in every fetus, every child, every embryo, there is the DNA of that child's ultimate destiny. And in that DNA, there is the ability to mature, then survive, procreate, provide for the prodigy until the prodigy can repeat that process again. Now, I believe that in the DNA of of every fetus, that ability is placed in there before they ever get here. It's in there, you, you see, to survive. And, and, and then to survive in such a way that they 
procreate and, and to do that so successfully that their prodigy in turn is taken care of and provided for and that process repeats itself. Now, there are several things that can interrupt that process. First is human choice. You, you see, because something is placed in me doesn't mean that I choose to do that. For instance, at whatever point a child or a person would choose to become a drug addict and an alcoholic or whatever, their maturing stops. And, and we've all met those people. We've, we've all met people that were addicted to drugs as, as a teenager or became an alcoholic, and, and their social and emotional maturity stopped at that point. But that doesn't mean the ability wasn't placed in their DNA to mature beyond that. I believe that it was. And I believe that it's the process of life itself that brings out that ability in us as human beings. But if we interrupt that process with such things as drugs and with alcohol, and here's another one, with enabling parents, the process of maturity to independence stops at that point. I believe spiritually I can do the same thing. I, I, I think that God, by putting us in situations that ultimately force us to mature, regardless of how painful they may be, is his intentions. Just like in getting a child to mature. There are things that we have to watch, that we have to observe, and yet it, it is our job and responsibility at some point to do absolutely nothing, knowing they're going to suffer knowing that process is going to hurt them. But it's a part of the maturing process. When he says, all things work together. I see this child that is being interrupted by alcohol addiction, enabling parents, and their maturing stopping at that point. I don't think it had to. I think the ability to survive beyond that was placed in him or her or in you and me. I believe that I was given a destiny that in the end it glorifies God. I think that I was created also to be a child of God, to be his kid, to be the object of his love, of his affection, of his mercy as he intended. Now, when that process plays out, I can choose. I can choose not to, or I can choose to seek God's destiny all of my life. He loves me as his kid. He loves you as his kid. And so when I think about the sovereignty of God, he is this parent that permits me choice, even though he may suffer as he watches that, he permits me to choose, even though that may interrupt my destiny. He permits me choice, even, that, even though that may slow the entire process down. All things work together for them who love him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we feel and we sense your presence every moment of every day in our life. Even though we may push that away, God, I pray at some point we will embrace it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're in the sanctuary now, we're going to sing and read some more scripture, so just stay with us.